Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for making the effort to come to, to Birmingham today. Um, who's travelled the furthest? Who's from the far north of Scotland? Who's from the far southwest of England? Good, good. Who's from Ireland? Sort of, yeah, one. Wales? Great. Good. Local? Okay. Academics? Industry? Excellent. That's what we like to see. That's what we like to see. Good stuff. Great. Well, what I want to do is, um, is really try and reiterate the, um, uh, the points I was trying to, to deliver back in April when we had a, a little bit of a dry run around the, the launch of this particular call. Uh, one last show of hands. Who was here in April at the, at the briefing? A few of you. Okay, that's great. So it means that for those that weren't, I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into what it is that we're trying to, to achieve here with the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, um, explain the, uh, the, the background and the thinking behind the, uh, the process that secured this funding, and then give you a little bit of insight into um, the scope of this individual call that we've got, uh, got open just now. So I'm Callum Murray. I'm, I'm currently uh, Head of Agriculture and Food at Innovate uh, UK. I'm also one of the interim uh, challenge directors for, uh, for the transforming food production uh, bid that is part of this Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. My co-director, Andy Curtin from BBSRC, has been instrumental in delivering um, a lot of what we have here today, so my thanks uh, go to him. Um, but ourselves and BBSRC have worked extremely closely to try and pull this process together kind of on behalf of, uh, of, of the UK industry with a view to driving things uh, towards a successful international engagement as well as solving productivity within, within the UK. Um, so what we're here to discuss is the, the transforming food production uh, bid and, and challenge fund that is available through ISCF. Um, this particular round is focusing on productive and sustain sustainable crop and ruminant uh, uh, production systems, and I'll go into the detail that surrounds the whys and wherefores um, behind that individual call. But the challenge fund itself, I just want everybody to completely understand exactly what it is that we're trying to do. Government is here not to be philanthropic but to drive forward the opportunities for UK business so that existing industries are given the opportunity to really drive growth and to drive um, uh, profit to their bottom line and in this, at the same time be part of the strategic recovery of the UK economy. But we want to not only help and support those existing businesses, we want to create new businesses. This is a fast-moving environment and those new businesses that may not currently be engaged with agriculture see the opportunities come in and bring forward new, um, new thinking, new ideas to help us accelerate the exploitation of innovation within the, uh, within the sector. The idea, of course, is to deliver impact, to absolutely drive growth and thereby create jobs within the, within the economy. And the reason for asking who is here from the devolved administrations, this is a UK-wide offering. We're here to ensure that growth happens in all sectors, in, in, in all administrations within, uh, within uh, the UK, and of course within all sectors. The programme that we're going to be delivering just now will be multidisciplinary. It is all about accelerating and, and uh, uh, facilitating the, the stronger connection between industry and the research community so that we can really try and address some of the major challenges that exist within UK agriculture and indeed global agriculture. We know that within the, um, the agricultural production system, the, pr the production of food, there is enormous variability. This um, particular slide is simply a proxy for the variability it's looking at uh, nitrous oxide emissions across the UK, but in so doing, it reflects the challenges that exist in the different environments that we're dealing with within the UK environment. Clearly, if you extend this out to a global perspective, there are very significant ch challenges, be it drought, be it um, uh, you know, excessive uh, water, flooding, and, and, and so on. 
Um, extreme weather patterns, uh, variation in soil type, variation in topography, variation in, in climate and geography. All of these give major challenges to ensuring that we get the very best from the biology to drive production. We know that the sector is hugely important to the UK economy. We know that it underpins a vast employment within the UK. We're not saying that agriculture is responsible for 3.9 million jobs alone, but of course it underpins that, that capability. And it uses a significant amount of, of, the, uh, of the land mass within, uh, within the UK. But despite its relative importance, we're very much aware of the fact that agriculture in the UK, in terms of productivity, is lagging behind that of its peers. Now, I've already said and identified that we have huge variation within the UK. We're not dealing with a, um, a, a homogeneous type production environment. We've got multiple systems, very complex environments. But despite that, we are lagging behind the, the, uh, the competitors. So, government recognises that there is a potential here to elevate our game, to lift us up, to be at the point where we are, uh, are competing on that world stage. Arguably, and it's a fairly contentious point, I'm sure, are there any farmers here in the audience today? Great, that's good to see. Dare I say that the direct support that has been in place over the last umpteen years, several decades, has perhaps stifled innovation. It has stifled the necessity to drive productivity to the levels that could perhaps have been achieved. Now, who knows what will happen when we get into a post-Brexit uh, environment. We know that the government has already guaranteed to, to continue with levels of direct support at a, at a particular level. We're not going to get into the details of that here and now. But the point is we have to be in a position to get to the stage where we can genuinely stand on our own two feet. And in so doing, we need to have the innovations, we need to have the technologies that will take us forward. So it's critical to ensure that that innovation comes forward to give us the competitive edge. So, the challenge, you can all read. We absolutely want to transform food production systems so that by 2030, agricultural productivity is indeed market leading and that the environmental impacts that we're seeing in this particular sector have been reduced significantly. We've taken a view in consultation with others that 40% by 2030 is perhaps deliverable. That waste within that production system is absolutely minimized and co-products are generated and recycled into the system. And that the UK is in a position to be a leading exporter of data-driven precision decisions, support solutions that will exist for our domestic production as well as global production. So that's the challenge. It's not insignificant. So the vision that we had to sell to the chief executive of uh, UKRI, Sir Mark Walport, and with the reason we had to spend a little bit of time over the last few months to get the buy-in the, from the, the UKRI board, is clarifying what our vision will be. And we've set, stated that by 2030, food production across the UK will indeed be amongst the most productive, the most innovative, the most connected in terms of um, the connection between the research community and the producers, in terms of digital connectivity, in terms of global markets, and indeed the most resilient. We've seen the beast from the east. We've seen the extreme... Uh, uh, temperatures during this, this summer. We have huge variability within our, our climatic patterns. We need to be able to have a, a production system that can cope with that. But in delivering that, that we are uh, ever cognizant of the need for a sustainable and environmentally sustainable uh, production system. Economic sustainability is critical and it will come from the productivity element. But environmental sustainability is fundamentally part of what we're trying to deliver. So, Sir Mark asked us, what will future farming look like? Of course there's not one farm. Of course there's not one single type of production system that exists within the UK that can be taken as an exemplar for everything that you all do. So, looking at crop and livestock systems, in farmed animal systems, we know that despite the fact that sometimes the word precision seems to have been hijacked and claimed by the crop production system, there is a very real need for that precision to be applied in livestock systems. 
So we'll be in a position to see precision approaches routinely being adopted and used for the early detection and treatment of disease. Individualized nutrition. Nutrition of, of ruminants in this case will probably mean the nutrition of the microbiome. Thinking about the metagenomics within the rumen, what is it that we're trying to do? What is it we're trying to deliver? How can we get the best from that, that uh, individual targeted nutrition process? And absolutely engage with uh, tackling the need for improved reproduction strategies to, in ruminants' uh, sense, to, to shorten that, that calving interval, to ensure the, 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 the lambing percentage, the lambs sold are, are greatly enhanced and improved where the environment can support that. We also want to see real-time data collection analysis and analysis across the supply chains so that we can ensure that production and welfare and quality are all absolutely maximized to ensure that the producers retain a significant share of the value that they have created within that production system. I've spoken about environmental sustainability, that greenhouse gas emissions absolutely need to be minimized. This maybe takes us back in the ruminant system to that precision nutrition, what we can do to enable uh, decision support around the nutrition of livestock to, to minimize the, uh, uh, the emissions from the, the production of enteric methane, for example. But really making sure that breeds are optimally matched to their environment. Whether we're looking at easy care lambing systems, or easy care flocks, whether we're looking at new breeds, whether we're looking at composite breeds, what is it that we should be doing to ensure that the productivity of the, of the livestock involved is absolutely taken to the level that will um, maximize the return from the inputs that we've, uh, we've utilized and thereby increase productivity. So more production information uh, is required for the producers uh, to help them with that decision support, but from the consumer's perspective, we're absolutely able to give them detailed information about what it is that we've, um, we've uh, embraced within the production system to give them comfort that they are getting precisely the product that they require, and thereby perhaps be in a position to pay high, high premium for it. In crops, of course, we know that precision production systems are, uh, are perhaps better um, uh, in, uh, embedded within, within the, 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 that subsector, but being in a position to understand the, uh, the need for energy inputs. What can we do to absolutely minimize the extent to which we are taking forward soil disturbance, utilizing power to turn soil and, and what have you? What production, what engineering solutions are there out there that will allow us to, to optimize that energy use? To be in a position to precision irrigate, to, to know soil types, to embrace earth observation, be it from satellite or sub-cloud uh, drone technologies, to optimize the irrigation and indeed the nutrients and crop protection products that will be required uh, in, the, in the production of which, whatever crop it is, be it field scale veg, um, uh, broad acre crops and, and so on. Um, and labor efficiency. We talk about um, productivity in UK agriculture in terms of total factor productivity, all inputs, everything that is utilized to deliver on this uh, uh, particular production. But total labor productivity is a key point. And once again, the UK is lagging behind in terms of the, um, the return we get from the investment in that highly expensive, very expensive resource that is labor. And of course, the availability of labor comes into question here as well, particularly for field scale uh, veg crops in Lincolnshire, for example, but even in, in livestock systems where high quality stockmen are perhaps uh, less available than they once were. Soil quality um, is, is a, a critical asset. We need to understand better how we manage that, that, uh, that resource to, to, to get the best from it, to ensure biodiversity, uh, to protect natural capital, to think about uh, agriculture being part of the solution to uh, the climate change argument and, and the, the flood arguments and, and so on. So enhancing soil quality is inherent with all that we're doing within this particular call. We've always spoken about the need to connect supply chains. Supply chains, um, uh, I think, need to become more sophisticated so that we are in a position to... to uh, maximize the production for the market that exists at the time that the product is required. That degree of sophistication is starting to happen, but we could do better. 
And of course, we need um, advanced breeding technologies. So I've spoken about the idea of resilience within crop production, thinking about the variability in climatic uh, patterns and so on. But what can we do with the advent of the opportunities represented perhaps by, by hybrid wheats, for example? What are the opportunities there to, to, to deliver quality and sustainability as well as meeting those production goals? And then, of course, we need to think about those new production systems. I know that Sir Mark was very keen on the idea of looking at uh, what's happening in the Netherlands, what we can do in terms of uh, high-value crops, um, the extent to which we can bring production closer to the consumer with that higher degree of, of urbanization. Um, what can we do to drive forward the, uh, the entre entrepreneurial thinking that will see the development of um, uh, urban um, production systems, vertical production systems, subter I was going to say subterranean, but underground production systems. Um, it will involve um, aquaculture, it will involve um, uh, hydroponics, it will involve aeroponics, it will involve the, the combination of all of these technologies and it will involve the, the utilization of highly sophisticated uh, protected environment, sen sensors, uh, uh, fertigation, um, uh, water control, water recycling, all of the above, light intensities, um, wavelengths, all of these combined uh, technologies to give us the opportunity to drive high value cash crops within that urban environment. So protective environments will be, as we move forward, highly efficient systems, minimizing the energy use required for the production of particular crops. We'll move beyond perhaps thinking just about the leafy salad crops that are represented here into much more diversified uh, crop production systems. That's the, that's the element that we're uh, wanting to encourage as part of the broader novel food production system. So the mission behind all of this is to c connect people, ideas, and the funding. We are the, the folk that happen to have the funding available just now. We want you to realize that that funding is available, but it is, of course, a competitive uh, process as a competitive environment, but we really want to stimulate the thinking and catalyze your thinking to the extent that you see the opportunity, you see the challenge, you buy into the vision, and if you can do all of those things and come forward with real, innovative, exciting proposals, then the chances, of course, are, are real that you will, you will receive some of that uh, fairly significant funding that's available. But the solutions that come forward have to be disruptive. They have to be based on data-driven solutions that drive decision support across the agri-supply chains. In the context of this particular call, I'll go on to some detail behind the scope. So the objectives, create those uh, disruptive data-driven solutions, drive productivity, and reduce environmental, environmental impacts. We want to embed the, the adoption of precision approaches so that we can truly bridge the productivity gap to close the gap between what's happening on farm and realizing the true biological potential of crop or livestock production. We want to establish those novel high value production systems. We want to strengthen the connection that exists between practitioners and the researchers. And fundamentally, we want to drive growth of UK companies and thereby extend our marketing opportunities on that global stage. So all of the above are part of our thinking in relation to this, this bid. So what are we doing? The bid itself is transforming food production. It is focused on primary production. We're not really in the environment of um, food processing and manufacturing post farm gate, although we'll come on to some of the thinking along whole supply chain. The four strands that we're going to be funding with the 90 million pounds that has been made available to us, up to 90 million pounds, is to focus a significant chunk of the money into industrial-led collaborative R&D. Now, a lot of you have experienced this before. You've been aware of the Agritech Catalyst. Some of you may remember the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Innovation Platform. The, the, the thinking is similar, but this is, this. Um, particular call, this industrial-led R&D, will be quite focused, as you'll find, in individual calls, the terms and the scope of which will vary as we go forward. Several times today, I've already mentioned the idea of strengthening the connection between researchers and practitioners. 
And to that end, we want to create a community of practice. When I was here previously, back in, in April, we spoke about challenge networks, challenge platform networks. That's evolved. We were getting a little bit bogged down in, in the idea of networks and so on. But a community of practice is going to be the recipient of a reasonable chunk of this 90 million to try and pull together researchers and businesses into the areas of driving uh, a community that will, will help us recognize the opportunities for research and will, will, will be involved in the, the seed funding and the development of feasibility studies and leading the thinking behind what the priorities ought to be for the CR&D in the red box up top and indeed the demonstration proposals in that bottom lighter green box. The demonstration thinking is about embedding the adoption of precision approaches to bridge this productivity gap. We know that there's an element of uh, failure in the degree to which producers, practitioners, farmers and growers trust the advice that they're given. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is of significant importance. There is a network of um, demonstration sites already in place, be it the HDB monitor farms, the Agrieti Epi satellite farms, the, the TAG arable group sites, um, the LEAF demonstration farms with integrated pest management. We need to think about how we can use those resources, help them reach out to the practitioners, to the, 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 the real farming community, to showcase the opportunities that exist from uh, the adoption of new technologies in the various geographical, topographical, climatic environments that exist within the UK and take that thinking perhaps out onto a global stage. So that third peer, pillar, if you like, is where some of the money will go in terms of demonstration. The other aspect we're dealing with just now is looking at developing some bilateral agreements with the Chinese and the Canadians. It's limited to those two countries just now. The steering board were very clear that this wasn't a pot of money to go running around the world doing whatever we like. We needed to be focused. We can't spread it too thinly. We've got good, strong, close working relationships with the Canadians where a roadmap has already been developed and published. And there are very strong links with China just now where um, Agritech is very much the flagship challenge for their um, uh, science, technology, innovation center. Uh, they are, are keen to see that uh, taken forward. So China and Canada will see um, uh, the opportunities come forward for bilateral arrangements. So this particular call is seeing 20 million pounds being allocated from the 50 million pounds that is available. The aim of the call is to focus on crop and ruminant agricultural systems at this point in time. The reason for crop and ruminant just now is because we've got to spend all of our money by March 2022. Now, most of the other industrial challenge fund pots of money only have until March 2021. We made the argument that we needed at least three production cycles to see this go forward. We believed that for crop production systems and ruminant production systems, particularly the broad acre crops, um, they require three harvests. They have annual production cycles, whereas the monogastric production systems have shorter production cycles, and we can accommodate them in future rounds. They are not excluded altogether. They're just not being captured now. We wanted to ensure that those that need three years can have three years to get things uh, pushed forward. So for now, the focus is on crop and ruminant production systems. I hope you can see the various quadrants here to see what it is that we're trying to, to drive forward. In crop and ruminant production systems, we are looking for productivity solutions to a single challenge. So, for example, using a decision support mechanism, perhaps some kind of uh, sensor, a mimic sensor, to drive uh, the decision support around um, uh, pest control or disease control, or some aspect of soil analysis and sensors to, to really feed into variable rate application for fertilizer use or some aspects specifically focused on, on irrigation, if you like. Um, if it comes to uh, livestock systems, then some specific aspect that will lead to 
improvement in the carcass classification and the value of individual carcasses in, in ruminant production systems, or some aspect of behavior monitoring to understand the, 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 um, the complexities, if you like, of animal behavior to thereby improve the productivity in whichever environment you happen to be in. These particular elements are, uh, are, are in place, but we'll also be looking at much broader supply chain solutions involving multiple interventions from precision applications of feed or fertilizer or chemicals or what have you, to irrigation, to harvest dates, to, to storage, to logistics, to shelf life extension, multiple interventions on much more complex uh, projects, be it in crop or livestock systems, that will take, uh, take things forward. And the money available, I'll come on to in a moment, but uh, uh, these are bigger projects that will, be, that will be more complex. Of course, we want to see uh, the novel production systems embraced as well. And again, we'll be very happy to see single interventions up to one point or multiple stage, uh, multiple interventions across supply chains in urban development type, type systems, for example. So, the transforming food production goals will be in a position uh, to see the, uh, a, a real uplift in the efficiency and productivity of the of the production systems. That's fundamental to what we're trying to achieve here with the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Again, sustainability within that food production system absolutely has to be improved. You know, we are responsible for a significant footprint in food production. Whatever we can do to minimize that footprint, to maximize biodiversity, uh, sorry, to enhance biodiversity, to maximize uh, soil, water, and air quality, and reduce emissions across the piece, and of course, cut the waste that comes from that production system, is embraced within everything that we're doing here. At least it should be when you think about putting applications forward. The projects themselves absolutely have to have a clear route to market. We've encouraged people to engage with the practitioners in the room, to have the endorsement, to be in a position to showcase what the impact is likely to be, and demonstrate to the assessors, the independent assessors that will be re reviewing applications, what it is that um, you are going to be doing that will take these technology solutions through to market. We, to that end, we've asked people to think about the development of prototypes. Now, we had a little bit of a discussion earlier on, an optimized prototype is almost a contradiction in terms. But what we need to see is that this is a project that's taking something forward in this particular call that's not a feasibility study that will lead to further ongoing research. This is something that is sufficiently far up the TRL that we can see something coming to market reasonably soon. Again, the UKRI steering board needs to be able to go back and demonstrate to those in Treasury that we have delivered impact within this sector. We need to be in a position to poke a stick at something that has been achieved as a consequence of this. Perhaps too often in the past, we've allowed people to take things forward with a view to seeking future grants and future grants and taking things on to you know, small gains and slow movement up the TRL. We're trying to accelerate this now. This is an industrial strategy challenge fund to drive productivity and growth so that within barely a decade, we're in the upper echelons of productivity gains within our agricultural sector. We're absolutely encouraging businesses to come forward that bring new businesses and new technologies. How many times have we spoken to people outside of our, our inner circle, if you like, and explained to those outside of agriculture what our challenges are, what the opportunities are, what we need to tackle to drive productivity? Do we know whether or not solutions exist already outside of agriculture that can be applied here? Can we enthuse and encourage those people that are not actively engaged just now to come forward and help us to drive that uh, productivity gain, to drive the opportunities within our sector? So we're part of the community of practice, part of the outreach, part of the cross-sectoral thinking, the multidisciplinary thinking, is to bring new businesses and technologies into the UK 
and into the precision sector as it exists. We know that this precision ag type sector is going to grow at a phenomenal rate and we want UK companies to be part of that and we want to encourage those that don't already recognise it to come forward and see what they're missing. And again I've said, again I've said that we're in a situation that we want to include farmers and growers in the, the, the consortium, at least have strong endorsement. This is not about funding the development of academic papers. This is not about feasibility studies that are not going to lead to the development of a prototype. We, we sincerely want to see active engagement from producers who are going to give the endorsement and give our assessors the reassurance that what you are thinking of developing has practical application in the field. Okay, so the involvement, the endorsement, some of you might think, oh, farmers and growers, they're not going to have the money to co-invest and what have you. But we're not necessarily asking for cash contributions, we are asking for their engagement and then their involvement. So that will be something that we can perhaps talk about later, but it helps us get the, the feel that what is being done is very real and very practical. Just about there, the last point I want to make just now is just to reiterate that for the time being, monogastrics and aquaculture projects are out of scope. That's not to say that we don't see them as important. There will be future rounds. There are also other opportunities in existence within Innovate UK uh, through the, the open calls that exist where those subsectors can apply just now but we will be bringing forward future rounds in consultation with our advisory group to, to see what the priorities are. But for now, the monogastric systems are out of scope. This, is, this whole process is about transforming food production, so forestry and non-food crops are out of scope. Although wild capture fisheries are a very, very important industry, Politically, I'm sure it's a, it's a hot potato for, for discussion around Brexit and all the rest of it, and I'm sure innovation is, um, is fairly uh, important within that, that sector as well. But for now, wild capture fisheries are not part of the, the equation. Um, amenity and ornamental horticulture, again, it's food production. And again, the blood, bloodstock industry, equine, um, it's, it's not for us at this point in time. So these are the areas that are out of scope, um, but think very much around data-driven solutions driving decision support to enhance productivity in crop and ruminant production. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, that's, I believe, the end of my formal presentation. We've got until 11 o'clock. Um, this is, I was trying to speak for as long as I could to avoid, to avoid questions, but um, <laughs> I'm looking out and I can see 120 people and I'm just, just about to see 120 hands go up in the air. Are there any questions? Yeah. And what we'll do is we'll you, yeah, just raise your hand, we'll take your questions with a mic, if you just say your name and your organisation, and just hold the mic close to you because we've, we've caught this on the webinar so people in the webinar can hear things as well, so please go on. Uh, Connor Colgan of Aidensfield Research Farm in Northumberland. Uh, you talked about farmer engagement. Um, if you wanted to engage a farmer's time, are you allowed to create within your bid a f an amount of money to cover displaced time for farmers? Just to reiterate, are you, are you allowed to create time? Uh, I'm just saying farmers are stretched. Yes, yeah, sure. And any time or capital or you know, goodwill yes. usually isn't valued by farmers because they like the kudos or something if they fancy themselves in that particular way. Yes. But if you're commercially minded, they will obviously create a value to that. Um, in terms of the bid, um, if I were to put together a proposal where I wanted to collaborate with another farmer on a feed trial, for example, um, and it cost them a little bit of extra time to do the work, or it cost them a little bit of extra feed to do the work, are those costs allowable under a grant application? Yes, yes. As I say, we're not in a position of saying that the farmers and growers need to put in cash. The assets that they have in terms of land, their time, their buildings, their stock, all of which have a tangible value, that is an eligible cost within a consortium. You can either be in a situation of 
having the farmer as a subcontractor, in which case you as a consortium partner would pay that farmer for access to the, the, the stock as time, the buildings and so on, or if he is a, a consortium partner within the bid, then those costs would be eligible and he would get grant aid based on those costs as a consortium partner at the going rate, more likely or not 60 or 70 percent depending on the size of the business. Um, Richard Tiffin, uh, Agrometrics in the University of Reading. Um, can you clarify, please, what the uh, inter international dimension of the call actually actually means? So you, you've heavily focused on UK agricultural productivity, but at the same time you've talked about resilience in the supply chain. Now our supply chains extend way beyond the uh, beyond the shores of the UK. Are, is that so? Is understanding what's going on on farms internationally within the scope of this call, as well as um, working on farms that are in the in the UK? Sure. Did I didn't recognise you, Richard? That new growth that I'm seeing there, or something? Um, yeah. The uh, the international event. This 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 call, the, the CR&D call, is not just about domestic production. I've spoken about the opportunities for export opportunities for driving production. Uh, if we can be involved, if you as a cons have a consortium that can be involved in engaging with international markets to drive solutions where um, the, the profits associated with the IP generated would be repatriated or domiciled here in the UK, that's fantastic. It's obviously a bigger, uh, bigger market than the domestic market. To make, uh, to make it perfectly clear, uh, UK taxpayer money in the form of grant would not be paid to uh, consortium partners in foreign uh, uh, jurisdictions, so we would not see that grant going offshore, so to speak, but um, engaging on the international stage and driving international solutions is part of this. That's subtly different to the international dimension that I spoke about in relation to Canada and China, where we are restricted and we will have um, specific aspects drawn up in bilateral agreements, but just now, to, to tackle solutions that will drive productivity in, uh, in rice and cocoa and, and bananas and whatever is, is all perfectly legitimate at this point. Yeah, I was just going to ask a similar sort of thing. Um, I've been marked down in the past for having a, um, a company from abroad trying to be part of a bid. Mm -hmm. um, and is that still the same case then? Well, first and foremost, we will be giving uh, our independent assessors a briefing uh, on what is and is not eligible. So hopefully we'll address that so you won't be marked down if you are conforming to the rules, as we're describing. Um, the, the point of having a collaborator, um, if they're not in receipt of grant, you know, then and that, that shouldn't cause a, a, an issue for assessors. If they are a... Um, a, a sponsor, if you like, if, the, if it's an organization that's helping you engage and showcase whatever technologies outside of the consortium but in the country in question, that should be um, plus points rather than negative points, given the terms of your proposal. So just to be clear, there is, there is not the opportunity to fund those partners, but we're quite happy to see engagement with them. We're going to take a couple of questions from Callum on the uh, webinar. People from the webinar. Yeah, there are two questions currently um, from the web. Um, Callum, is there any prospect for non-food crops in a later call? No. That's a simple answer. And the second question at the moment, is there still a plan to have hub bids? To have what bids, sorry? Hub bids. Hub bids. Um, well, the, yeah, the, the community of practice, I'm not going to get drawn into all the details behind that just now because we're working with the advisory group to see how best to establish that. But a, a hub um, is very much part of how we will manage the community of practice um, with um, uh, oversight, if you like, of subsector groups relating to crop and livestock production systems to identify priorities for feasibility studies and so on. So uh, once we get to the detail behind the community of practice, um, we'll be explaining that in more detail. But for now, there's not 
the potential within this CR&D call, but at some future point there will be a chance to talk about uh, bids relating to a hub of some sort. Okay, thank you. Hello, it's a, a quick question on your co-cropping. If you have a food crop associated with a non-food crop, which might be an energy crop, would that be in scope or out of scope? Joel, <laughs> um, enhancing productivity, if, I think the focus would be on uh, driving productivity of the food crop in a dual cropping environment. So the way in which you present the application would be to say, this is what we need to do to ensure that land is utilized to best resource and we can secure production of X whilst similarly producing a non-food energy crop. Um, so that, that aspect could come in, but it would be, you know, the, the, the decision support and the technologies required to, to drive that production system would clearly have to embrace the complexity of a dual cropping environment. To ask that another way around then, so if that non-food crop reduced, reduced the waste and improved the efficiency and provided energy, it's still not eligible? Well, we're, as I say, we're not in a position of, you know, there's a number of production systems that could come forward that are developing uh, straightforward inputs, if you like, rather than uh, decision support, data-driven solutions to the productivity. So it, well, we can talk in more detail, perhaps offline, the semantics around what it is you're, you're, you're proposing. But um, the production of um, a nutrient source, for example, as a consequence of driving an, uh, the production of an energy crop, um, wouldn't in itself be in scope. But I, I, there's, there's maybe something there to, to talk okay, about. Okay, thank you. Ladies first. Thanks. Uh, I'm Catherine from Small Robot Company. Um, is there a maximum number of uh, Innovate UK bids you could be the lead partner on, or yeah, to, combination uh, between lead partner and supporting partner? I think partner? We'll, we'll cover all of those details in the, the next round, but I think I'm right in saying it's lead one and participate in two. In addition, in addition yeah, to that one. Yeah. Pardon? In, in, in addition, addition yeah. One. Lead one, but participate in an additional two bids. Uh, John Newbold from Volac. This is probably also another detailed question that may come up later, but companies and their eligibility. If you uh, a UK registered company uh, that's registered with Companies House but is a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign company, is that eligible? Absolutely. You know, there, I think that yes, yes. There are many multinationals that have trading companies here in the UK. Um, we do ask that those companies that are registered in the UK are more than a PO box, that they have a trading ability. Um, they're undertaking perhaps some research and sales and employment and so on, but yes, absolutely. We'll take a question at the back from Callum first and uh, on the webinar. Another one from online. Uh, will bids be strengthened by having a knowledge transfer slash key component to the proposal? For example, the project trials are partly conducted uh, on monitor farms or results presented to the monitoring farm groups. Um, Knowledge exchange and um, the dissemination of, of the learning, if you like, is a, a, is a very important consideration. Um, to say that it would strengthen the bid is, um, I think it's fair to say that it would, you know, I think it's fair to say that it would. It can't be the, the sole component. This is not just about driving um, skills and knowledge exchange. Some of that will come in with our, our demonstration type proposals. Um, it, it's something to note going forward that skills are very much on our, uh, on our agenda and, and knowledge exchange and so on. Um, but for now, um, if, if the project is driving understanding that will help, you know, you know, the tide come in and raise all ships, then that's something to be applauded, I think. Yeah, I'm Julian Gaiden from Rosier Systems. Um, Callum, uh, in April you mentioned the ag tech centres yep. as part of this, and clearly 
you know, this is kind of now the OPEX part of what was then the CAPEX to set the things up. And you haven't mentioned anything about the relationship with ag tech centers in, in yep. this initial call. So first part of the question is, is there a relationship and are you expecting most of these uh, competing bids to come through or be endorsed by the ag tech centers? And then the second part of the question relating to the community of practices, why is that being set up when we've got four ag tech centers which ostensibly were set up to bring people together and put these sorts of things together so why is that not a duplication of effort okay um good point good questions um i think at the outset it's fair to say that we were um not only instructed but we genuinely believed it wasn't right to ring fence money here specifically for the centers um there are a number of uh, highly respected institutions out there that are not currently part of or members of one of the four centres. Um, I think they might cry foul if we were to ring fence the money specifically for them. That said and done, the capability that's been generated by this, the, the investment in the four centres is such that um, we would be surprised if um, projects didn't come forward that involved each of the centres and that those applications were particularly strong given the, the involvement of the centres because of the investment and the capability that those centres have. So this call is absolutely open to the centres. We would encourage people to speak to each of the chief executives. I've seen two here. I've seen Fraser. I can see Dave. Is Lindsay? Casey at the back, and we've got Richard representing Agri Can you all just right. stand up, please, uh, each of the people in the centres? There's. That's Casey. At the, Casey, yeah. you put your hand up for CL. Casey, you put your hand up, please. Casey, stick your hand up. Casey. So Casey's from CL. We've got. Um, Fraser. Fraser from CHAP. We've got Dave from um, Agri FE. And we've, we've got, got Richard. Richard representing Agri Metrics. So yeah. please do speak to him today. We've got a presentation from Dave representing all the centres later on as well. So, the, to answer your question, Julian, the, yes, the, the centres, we would expect them to be uh, actively engaged in a number of bids. Um, the point about community of practice, um, I think I've already answered it. There was not going to be money ring fenced, particularly for the, the centres as such. Sir Mark is very keen to see uh, engagement across the piece to, to strengthen the, uh, the connectivity with all research institutes, not just those involved in the centres. Um, it's a legitimate question, but it's one in discussion with the steering board that led us to the conclusion that they are not the only show in town. They're very strong participants, but they're not the only show in town. Uh, sorry, a quick question and follow-up. Um, in the bids, how do the Agritech centres uh, appear? Are they an SME, a research organisation? I think you have discussions with each of the chief executives. They are companies limited by guarantee, um, depending on the relationship with the, uh, with the consortium partners. If they are going to be free to disseminate the findings and the IP from each individual proposal, then they could engage as, a, as a, an RTO, a research and training organisation. If, for example, there was restrictions on what they could or could not say, uh, then, and, and the, the IP was going to be exploited solely by the, the consortium partners, then they would have to engage as a, as a company. Hello, you mentioned that an SME can only lead one, collaborate in two others. What about the ag tech centres? If they're the limited same, to... The same rules apply. Okay, so that's going to be quite same limiting rules. then. Yeah, the, it's, you know, the... the, the, the Sorry? Yes, 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 absolutely. You'll get, you'll get more details about, from, uh, uh, from our competitions team talking about you know, how they engage as a research training organisation. But in terms of exploiting IP, the same rules apply as it would to, to a small robot company, for example. Hello, uh, Joanna from Sensonomic. Um, on a similar theme, um, as there's this lost talk collaboration, I'm guessing that uh, consortiums and university industry partnerships will have stronger bids or is that a misinterpretation? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I followed the question. So um, would you have preference for a consortium that involved a mix of universities and industry oh, and yeah. also being a consortium rather than just an individual company or institute? Okay, the, this, in, 
we, we, are, we are keen that the consortium that come forward is the best consortium for the job. There is, there is no, there's not going to be any preferential um, recognition given to a particular mix of business to academia, business to business, business to academia and business, or the size of a uh, consortium. It simply needs to be appropriate. The extent to which academics can engage the, in terms of the, um, the overall costs, again, will be covered in the detailed presentation that comes next. But for now, let me just say that academics um, would be limited to 30% because this is an industrial strategy. This is all about productivity and driving that uh, industrial capability. Um, but beyond that, there's, there's no particular preference. Sorry, could you bear with me? Just, uh, the, we think we need the microphone again. You're looking for consortiums then, not, yeah. not individuals. Yeah. 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 Hi, Callum. Before you talked about a portfolio approach, if you, for whatever reason, have to go before or later and it fits exactly into this scope, should we be making every effort to get into this call or can we go into open competitions later on or earlier um, or will this sort of be it in terms of uh, ruminant and crop? Um, um, we haven't decided what the terms of the future CRD calls would be, so I'm not going to say uh, Never, you know, that there's no no chance. Um, this is the this is the only chance we have for you to be able to engage in delivering projects that will take three years to complete. Okay, so that's that's number one. Uh, there will be further opportunities in the open calls, and these calls will run um, very very frequently. You know, several times a year. Um, so you will always have the chance to apply to that, but. We will need to um, have more detailed discussions with the advisory board, advisory group, to identify what the priority are, priorities are for future calls. So, for example, if we were to go down the route of monogastrics only, then clearly um, ruminant systems would not be in, in eligible for, for that future call. But that decision hasn't been made yet. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, Colin's going to be around all day as well as his colleague, Andrew McClay. Where's Andrew? So if you've got particular questions, grab Callum during one of the breaks. Thanks again, Callum. Thanks, David. I'd just like to introduce um, Julie Brown from Innovate UK now, who's going to talk you through the competition details. Thank you, Julie. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Callum. Okay, just to get straight on, uh, I'm just going to talk around uh, the agenda today. We're going to look at eligibility. We're then going to look at the application process, which is IFS, our new funding system. We'll look at the project details, application questions. Um, we'll then go through the finances. So this will be the project costs, uh, academic partners, if you have any academic partners in your consortium. Oh, I'm not loud enough. Hang on a minute. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, we'll go through submitting your application, the assessment process, project set up for successful applicants, and then we'll do a quick Q&A session. I do appreciate it. it's a lot of information, and I'm hopefully that you're going to be engaged throughout. Oh, now I've broken the system. Hang on, here we go. So just to talk through eligibility. Now Callum's already gone through this and can I just say that all the information you require is online. Um, it's already published, it's online. You'll see everything that I'm gonna talk about today there. So project eligibility to lead a project. You must be a UK based SME if your project costs are under 100K. Uh, you'll be a UK uh, based business of any size if your project costs are over 100K. Projects under 100 can be single or collaborative. If your projects are over 100,000, you have to be collaborative and you must include an SME in your um, consortium. You must carry out your project in the UK and you have to exploit the, ex um, the results anywhere in the world. So project cost, here we're looking at two different streams, productivity solutions, uh, total project costs um, are up to two million. Supply chain solutions, the total eligible project costs are up to five million. Project length, 
projects must start by the 1st of April 2019 and end by 31st of March 2022 and can last up to 36 months. Like I say, all this information is available on the website, so please do go and have a look. Okay, participation and collabora uh, collaboration rules, I should say. Uh, please remember that at least 70% of the total eligible project costs must be incurred by the business. If you have an academic or RTO in your consortium, the maximum level of project cost is 30%. Um, um, if you have um, a two or more in your consortium research organisations, they must share that 30% between them. Um, and this is in any capacity. So this is whether or not they are contributing as collaborators or if they are subcontracting. So please remember that. Um, research organisations are not able to lead in this competition, but can partner in as many as uh, uh, sort of applications as they wish. The leads must claim grant, and if collaborative, like I said, there must be two organisations, including the lead claiming grant. This is very important. Assessors will be looking to see um, that effective collaboration is detailed in the application form. Okay, making more than one application and resubmissions. Um, a business can be involved in up to three applications, but can only lead in one application. Um, uh, Innovation Leads will consider your application a resubmission if it is not materially different from a previous application. So here, you can resubmit, um, you can put your um, project in for a competition twice. Um, if it is deemed out of scope, it is classed as a, a submission. Uh, so you can only put that in twice. If you are taken out of the competition because you're ineligible because of project costs or you go over on the duration, etc., that is not considered a uh, submission. So it's only if you are taken out of a competition for your project because you're out of scope that is classed as a resubmission. Okay, other innov innov oh, I can't say it. Innovate UK projects. Uh, if you have an outstanding final claim, an independent account report on any live Innovate UK project, you will not be eligible to apply for grant funding in this competition as a lead or a partner organisation. If you have applied for a previous competition as the lead or sole company and were awarded funding by Innovate UK but did not make any substantial effort to exploit that award, we will award no more funding to you. On the first point, the final claim and the IAR report, you can submit your application or your yeah your um, application into this competition. If you are eligible and it goes for assessment, we will write to you and let you know that you have an outstanding final claim or your report hasn't been submitted and you have until the end of that assessment period to make sure that report is in with us or the final claim is paid. Um, otherwise, you will not be eligible to carry on with funding. Okay, key dates. Uh, competition open 20th of August. We're here today uh, at the briefing event. The submission deadline, this is when the competition closes, is the 24th of October, and that's noon, which means 12 o'clock noon. That's a hard deadline. Anything after that, we will not, we'll not be able to accept it. Um, applicants will be informed if they're successful or not on the 7th of December 2018. Okay, how to apply using the Innovation Funding Service. Um, hopefully you've all applied with us before, but if not, I'm just going to do a couple of slides on just how to um, get around the system. Um, you go to the Innovate UK website, top right hand corner it says latest funding opportunities, click on there and it will take you through to the backslide, innovation um, competitions. From there you can put in keywords and this will be all our um, competitions that we have open at the moment, so you can just put food in there, um, or productive and sustainable crop, the, the, the name of the competition, it will bring up the summary page. There will have details um, on the competition, the, the, the dates, it's open, closed, the amount of money, um, grant funding that is available. Um, if you are interested, um, you can then have a look at all the different tabs. As you can see, it has scope, eligibility, so everything we're talking about today is detailed there. The application questions, if you go to the tab how to apply, just scroll down and it has all the questions and all the guidance there for you to have a look. If it's something you're interested in and you think it fits within your project, you just click on apply. Okay, if you've um, applied with us before, you just need to log in using your account. If you haven't, you will need to create an IFS account. 
very, very easy to do. It, you can use Companies House to look up uh, or search for your organisation to save you typing in the address. Um, if you're not in Companies House, you can uh, manually enter it online. We do advise that research organisations and academics uh, manually enter their information so they are not listed as a business on IFS. Um, and that just makes sure that they, they get the correct funding. Okay, you've logged in, you've set up your uh, site. Um, from here, you can set up your consortium and invite team members. Uh, team members are other people from your organization who you may wish to uh, help you work on the application. Collaborators are your partner organizations that you wish to invite in. Um, all you do is send them an email. The, the system does it automatically for you. Um, so you just click on there and put their email address and it will invite them into your application. This helps them um, fill in your form. So if you have a particular area you would like your collaborator to um, help you with on one of the questions, you just email, send it across to them. They put all their information in and they can send it back to you. It can go backwards and forwards rather than um, doing the paper chase that we have to do on, on email. Uh, T's and C's, because we don't uh, send you out a uh, conditional offer letter anymore, once you start putting all your, or applying for a competition, yourself and all your collaborators will need to agree the T's and C's up front. It just saves us that step later on in the competition should you be successful. Okay, so this is what the uh, pages look like. So w when you do come round to answering a question, um, you can assign questions to other people in your organization, as I've just said. Um, you can edit your um, answers, even if you've marked it as complete. We can see there we have online guidance and we have really comprehensive online guidance for every single question. So it's well worth having a look at that and making sure that you've answered all the questions within that guidance. Um, we have uh, an area where you can format your answers now. So those of you who've applied with us before, especially on the old system, you just had one A4 page, you had to cram everything in. Now we have a word count, you can bullet point, you can bold, you can make it look really good for the assessors to read so it's nice and easy for them to read. Each of the questions on this competition is 400 uh, words uh, answer and there's a word count at the bottom so as you're going along you can keep track. Okay, the application form, it has three sections that we'll uh, like you to fill out. It has the project details. This is unmarked, but it sets a scene for the assessors. We then have the application questions, which are 11 questions in this case, and they are marked. And then your finances. It is an overview, and the finance overview, which I will sh uh, give you a quick view of, is what the assessors see when they're doing their um, assessment of your application. Okay. Project details, so this is the only bit I'm going to go through on the, um, uh, in, into all the uh, application form, I should say. So application details, here we need you to make sure that you, uh, your research category is correct and the size of your business is correct, just to make sure that that's the right amount of grant that you are receiving. Project summary, this is um, you to highlight the need or challenge, approach and innovation uh, and the outcomes. It really sets the scenes for the assessors. A public description, this is only used if you're successful on the competition and this is what we'll uh, publish online, so be very, very aware of confidentiality in this bit. Uh, scope, it's really, really important as you can imagine that your project is in scope for this uh, competition to receive funding. Um, so please use this field to justify how your project fits within the scope for the assessors. If you're unsure as to whether or not your application is in scope for this competition, please do uh, talk to our customer services, which I'll talk a bit, bit later on. Okay. This is a view of the application form. This is the 11 questions. They're all marked questions, as we just said. You are allowed appendices for four of them, so that's questions two, three, seven, and eight. They are all um, one megabyte in size. There is page limits on each of them, so each of the questions will actually detail the amount of pages you are allowed for the appendices. If you do submit more than the required pages, we have told the assessors not to look at that and disregard that information. So they will only look, if you're allowed two A4 pages, they will look at the two four pages. Please don't put any hyperlinks um, in um, appendices. Um, again, the assessors have been instructed not to look at those. Um, like I said, for each of the questions, there is detailed guidance, at least four, or it, more than that, in actual fact, bullet points on each of the questions. So to really make sure that you get the best application in, go through the questions and just make sure that each of the guidance cr um, criteria that you've answered on that question to make sure you get the best possible mark from the assessors. 
again, all this information is on the how to apply tab of the competition, which is online. Okay, application finances. There's three parts to uh, complete. Each organisation is responsible for completing their own finances and all the sections must be completed uh, before each partner can mark as complete. The sections will vary uh, whether you are an academic or a business. So what we'll be looking at is your project costs, your organisation and your funding. So we'll just quickly touch all of these. Uh, once you, this slide's slightly out of context, mind you, this should be the very end, but once you're happy that all your project costs have been added to the system, you'll be given a final opportunity to review. You will also need to confirm that the costs you have included are eligible as the, uh, per the project cost uh, guideline and guidance, which is online, remember, and then mark this section as complete. As you can see, there's a box there that's saying that you do understand that um, and you have looked to see if your project is within um, the guidance um, guidelines. Um, there is also a link there which will enable you to go back to those guidance um, headlines as such and have a look before you mark it as complete. Now we're going to look at your organisation. Okay, this is the information we ask you to provide. Uh, the organisation side det uh, determines the size of the grant that uh, your organisation is eligible to receive, and I'll have a little bit more information about that later. The other information does help us with our viability checks if your application is successful. Uh, if you are a recent startup company uh, who hasn't yet had a financial year, you can just input zeros here. If your application is successful, you do need to be registered on Companies House before any funding is released. Okay, now we're going to look at your funding section. This is the information I said I had on the funding is dependent on the type of organisation. So for this competition, we're doing industrial research. So for businesses, micro and small, you're eligible for 70%, medium 60 and large 50. Research organisations, uh, university is 100%, which is 80% of their full economic cost. Uh, again, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Other research organisations can claim 100% of their project cost, but there is a caveat. Uh, they must be non-profit distributing and disseminate the project results and explain in the application form how they are going to do that. Other research organisations such as charities or public sector organisations can claim 100% of their eligible costs, but again, they must be performing research activity and disseminate project results and explain in the application form how they're going to do that. Uh, please ensure that any eligible costs you uh, put in here do not include any work or costs already um, funded from other public sector bodies. Right, here's an example of how the funding rules might work for an industrial research for a CR&D project. So I'm hoping this is a bit clearer. You've got five um, members of the consortium, two SMEs, a university, a catapult, and a large. Okay, so you can see there the businesses, medium, uh, two mediums and a large, they've got their total eligible costs and they've got the amount of funding they are allowed uh, based on the size of their company. Um, and then with their project contribution. In the light grey, the university and the catapults uh, are entitled to 100%, which is 80% of their full economic costs um, there. So total eligible costs, 500,000. Now, the research participation is no more um, than 30%. So if you take the grey out areas, the university and the catapult are 75,000 each, that's 150,000, 150,000 into 500 is 30%. So they cannot have any more funding than that. So that's something to be very mindful. Businesses have to be 70%, universities, research organisations, 30. If you have more than two, two, three, however it is, they all share that 30 percent. Hopefully that makes it a bit clearer. Um, your funding. There is no conditional offer letter, as we said, with this process, so it's really important that each organisation acknowledges and accepts the standard grants, T's and C's. Um, your funding section will ask you to confirm the percentage of grant funding that you require. As you can see there, again, it's got another link just so you can be doubly sure of the grant funding that you are applying um, relates to you and the size of your company. Um, there is a drop-down box for you to actually put in the amount of funding that you require because some companies, say a small company, is entitled to 70%. They don't always take the full amount, so they can just choose their own amount that they want. 
Um, other funding. You must declare any other funding, uh, public sector funding, you're receiving this project, as it will be deducted from the total amount of funding that you're eligible to receive. So, looking at that other funding, uh, you must tell us if you've received any other public sector funding related to this project and this project only. You need to declare if you've received uh, funding elsewhere, as I've just said. Um, if you've received funding for previous work that has led to this project, you, it does not need to be listed. Uh, any funding that you have received will be taken off your grant funding allowance. Uh, finances overview. So here, before submitting your application, you'll be able to view the financial overview. Uh, this page again states the rules for the competition, including eligible total project costs and the project duration. Please check that your figures are in line um, with the uh, funding rules for this competition. We cannot, and I cannot stress this enough, this is such an important, but this is where most of our competitions get taken out because they're ineligible, and, and it's, it's loads, it's, it's madness. So we cannot stress the total project cost must be within the published um, eligible cost rather than the funding that you're looking at getting. It is the total project cost. So for here, if you are, um, Say so you, you're doing your project, let me have a look at that. It's 100, 100,000, just for instance, 100,000 is the total eligible cost. That does not mean the amount of funding that you're receiving. You must make sure that your, and that's for all partners within the consortium, does not go above that 100,000. Otherwise, you will be taken out of the competition. So often, um, applicants get confused and think the total eligible cost, they're entitled to, uh, say, 100K of grant. When it's not, it's the total eligible cost. So hopefully I've made that very clear. Okay, non-grant claiming partners. Uh, if you're not requesting funding, you can simply select the not requesting funding tab and the system will automatically update, graying out the other sections as they won't need to be completed. Uh, if you have selected the not uh, requesting funding in error, you can click the button again and it will just take you back. Uh, please um, note the partner must, if they are contributing but not getting grant, they must complete the project costs um, to put in the contribution and they will not be named in the grant offer letter if your project is successful. Okay, academic partners, really quick slides on academic partners. If you do have any academic partners within your consortium, they do need to complete a JES form, which they are completely familiar with. Innovate UK do not hold this system, so we can't get the figures ourselves. So it, it's, it is with the research councils. They're completely familiar that they should be able to do this, no problem at all. Their finance section looks complete, it's, it's slightly different, not completely, slightly different. Academic partners will only have to complete the, your project cost section. Um, and they will be included as a collaborator in your project. They, once they've done their JES form, um, they need to include their unique reference number and put it in IFS. Um, then they have to look at their contribution column, which will be the 80% of the 100% that they are entitled to. Again, they're fully familiar with this, and that figure will be entered um, into IFS on their project costs. So you must make sure the figures on the JES form actually match the figure that's in the application form. They almost have to also send us or upload a copy of the JES form with a with council status, but again, they're completely familiar. It's not just the figures they need to send to us, they also need to uh, send us justifications of resource and pathways to impact. This is just put on the system as an appendix, they're fully aware again of this. Um, if you or your academics want any more information on the JES system, the helpline is there. So I would suggest they go on and there's, there's help on how to fill out the JES forms and how to register as such like. Okay, submitting your application. This is a summary of the project costs uh, available to all the organisations in the project. This is the only uh, level of detail it will go into. It won't go down to any further detail for any other partners, apart from obviously your own. You'll be able to see your own um, finances in a lot more detail. And this is the view the assessors will see. Now, if you have any subcontracting costs, as you can see, you can see subcontracting costs. You need to justify those in your application form because, again, the assessors won't see any more detail than what's actually up here. So if you do have any subcontracting costs, it's very, very important to include why, why you're using them, what they're needed for, etc. in your application form. 
Okay, so for collaborative applications, IFS will highlight to the lead applicant any partners who have outstanding project finances to complete. All the finances must uh, be included in the application before the lead applicant can submit. So it is the, the role of the lead applicant to uh, make sure that all the partners are actually completing the form um, the, the, the way they need to. And once they have um, put all their finances in, they actually mark it as complete. And that will enable the lead to mark the application as complete in order for them to submit. Um, what, one thing to know, IFS does not validate your project costs, so it is up to you guys to make sure that your project costs fall in line with the eligible costs of this competition. The only thing it will validate or bring up a banner to is if your participation rates are um, slightly off, so you have got an academic within your consortium whose costs actually are more than 30%, it will actually tell you that, but it will not validate any other costs. Okay, you can review before you submit. So as you see, everything must be green and complete. If there is any outstanding areas, it will show. Um, you will then, again, a really, really important uh, point here, big green button. A lot of applicants forget to press the green button. They do everything. It gets to 100%. It says 100% on their screen, but you must press the submit. Otherwise, you, you, you miss the chance to be in the competition. So that's very, very important. This is my best slide. Right, we're able to track uh, uh, site usage and submission uploads. So it's showing the number of applicants uh, submitting their proposals each hour uh, leading up to the noon deadline. So many applicants leave it to the very, very last minute. By the skin of their teeth, they get in. But once it gets to 12 o'clock, a second past 12 o'clock, the whole system shuts down. Doesn't matter how much pleading, how much everything you do, it, it just you can talk to customer services you will not get through. If you do not press that green button before 12 o'clock, it won't come through. Um, our suggestion or recommendation always is to try and apply earlier so that if you do come across any problems, any IT issues, or you've got, you know, your, your partner hasn't submitted or marked as complete, we, we can work that out for you. So please let us know. But yeah, that's uh, quite a good slide to show. Um, once you have submitted, you'll get an email saying application submitted. Uh, IFS will send the lead this email to let them know. It will inform you what's going to happen next, so it's quite clear, uh, including any notifications or uh, feedback dates. And you may view or print your submitted application at any time. This is what your dashboard will look like. So the bottom one there is your application in process. So you've submitted, it's now waiting to be assessed. The top one is successful and um, is now waiting for you to set up your project in, uh, we call it project setup. Okay, assessment. So your application is successful. Um, uh, this involves a scope check and then it's reviewed by five independent assessors. They are brought in from industry and academia. Um, their feedback is collated into a final score. Assessors tell us time and time again they want clarity, detail and justification and to see that the application has represented a viable opportunity for growth through an exciting innovation where public funding will make a real difference to developing their idea and they have the right people with the right skills um, and the right approach to run a successful project and exploit the results. So please, please answer the questions in the guidance so the assessor can uh, mark you or award you the most marks. Uh, even if you have a fantastic idea, if you don't answer the questions, that they can't um, score well. So please make sure it does read well. Um, just think about the assessor. They will be reading loads and loads and loads and loads of applications, so make yours stand out. Assess the feedback, um, successful and unsuccessful um, applications do get feedback. It goes onto the IFS site and the lead, um, whoever's the lead in this application, will get an email or notification, I should say, on the site to say that the feedback is ready. All it is is the questions 1 to 11, you'll have the average score out of all the five assessors and then under each of the questions you'll have the five individual um, assessors' comments on that score that they've given. Last couple of slides. IFS, so I'm sure you'll all be successful. Um, um, if you are, you then have to set up your project in uh, our project setup phase. Um, it needs to be completed by yourself and all partners within 30 days, if possible. You can start your project as soon as you've been notified that you are successful, and projects should start within 90 days. Um, we no longer issue a, um, uh, what do you call it, conditional offer letter. 
after notification, because you're signing up to our T's and C's as you go along, so you know. Um, the lead has visibility of the progress of all the partners, and so has a responsibility of pushing them through. The lead will need to provide a collaboration agreement and an exportation plan, and each partner should provide their bank details and finance contact. So often, this, this, this part of the process just stops because the partners do not include or tell us their uh, finance contact and uh, bank details. So it's really important that gets done straight away. We will assign you a monitoring officer who will be your main point of contact throughout the project. We'll also review your finances to check your costs are eligible and the businesses involved are legal entities and can meet their match funding requirements. Okay, collaboration. This is always a sticky point. It takes a long time to get a collaboration agreement in place. And as you can see, project setup is 30 days, so don't wait until you're successful. Try and get this started as quickly as possible, because it can uh, catch people out. Grant claims and payments. This is my last slide, you'll be glad to know. If you're successful and start your funding, or your grant, or your project, I say, with grant funding, you need to be aware of the fact that we play your uh, claims quarterly in arrears. So if you are a small organization, um, just be wise to manage your cash flow. Um, the pattern of claim payments can impact, as, as I've just said. Another thing to bear in mind, all costs have to be incurred and paid between a start and end date of the project. You cannot claim for costs before the project has received confirmation to start or after it has finished. That was a lot, a lot of information. Um, we do have one other really, really important service is our customer support services at innovateuk.gov.uk. Um, if I don't answer any questions today, or that is a load of information, if you're unsure of process, unsure of scope, anything, please do email our customer support um, services. They will then direct those questions to the relevant person and get you an answer, hopefully within 48 hours, because that's their SLA. So they will come back to you. So please, please do use that. There is obviously the KTN um, email up there as well. And if you're looking at any other opportunities, please go to our innovateuk.gov.uk uh, uh, website to look for any other information so that's all it is from me finished that's brilliant. thank you thank you very much julie um, has anyone got any questions for julie there's one in the middle from clive to start off um i've got a question about um farmer involvement if we're putting a project together that farmers are involved with a lot of farms aren't limited businesses or registered at Company House, the partnerships. How, how do they, uh, are they eligible, eligible and, and how is that covered? Yes, yes you are. The only thing we would say is you have to be on Company's House before uh, any funding is actually um, released to you. So as, as you're going through your application, put your application together, but just, and, and I think where we ask about your organisation, just put zeros in there, but you are eligible to apply, but you must be on Company's House before. Oh. Hang on, Callum might have some other information. I think it's fair to say that an awful lot of farm businesses will be sole traders or partnerships, and they wouldn't be registered on company's house. So for that purpose, there'll be a verification, there'll be a check carried out to ensure that they're a legitimate UK business and registered as a UK business, but they may not be in company's house. So let, let's take it that the okay. nuances in agriculture will you know, we'll, we'll understand that most businesses will be partnerships or sole traders. Okay, okay. But we can double check. No, that is a good point. <laughs> so another question in the middle, was it? Question? One towards Buckley. Um, it's just a technical point on there being, if you've got a final claim or accountant's report, is, it, is that only if you've got those two specific um, outstanding Innovate UK requirements that you can't apply again. Oh, that's the IAR and uh, yeah, the, the final IAR. claim. Yes, yeah. it's only those. If you've got a live project running, oh yes, you, you can fine. apply. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a live project, absolutely, it's not a problem. The only thing I would say is just be aware that we will be doing viability checks and such like. Just making sure that you've got the resource and the ability to run two projects together. But yeah, that, that's not a problem. Hi, thank you for that. Just to clarify this, I've, I've maybe missed this, but can an academic partner be involved in more than three projects? Yes, yes, you can lead in as many as you like. 
You can lead as many as you Not like. Not lead. Stop it. That, Julie, sorry, that was my head. You can uh, participate in as many as you like. You can't lead, but you can be in as many as you So as you, you can't lead to. any? You can't no, as a, as a research, that. no. But you can be in as many as you, as you want or you see yes. fit to be involved with. Yes, okay? that's right. Sorry. Okay. Slip of the tongue there. <laughs> Hello, Simon from Pyogenesis. Um, if you, you mentioned about um, with RTOs, if the um, work is going to be of the project is just purely commercial, they're not going to be able to publish any of their findings or research, then they could be incorporated as an SME, not as an RTO. Does that also apply for academic partners? I'm, not I'm really not clear on that one. I think, I think you were thinking about the agritech centres there where they can have a dual role in terms of being an RTO and SME. Um, and I think the question is, can academics do the same? Is that right? And the case would be no. So, so no, the case would be no, they'd have to go in as a university partner and not an RTO, yeah. Okay. Charlie, can you, there's a question just down here, please. Hi, Obi from Pine. I just wanted to clarify. Um, you mentioned in one of the slides that the total eligible cost per project stream, I think for production, was below two million, and for supply chain systems, was below five million. Five million. Is, is that correct? Was yes. it grant or eligible cost? That's total project costs. Total, total project, project right. eligible costs. Yeah. <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, um, how many farmers actually apply for these grants, or? Do you tend to find that it's the trade that surrounds farmers that apply for these grants in order to sell farmers more kit, more gear, more feed? And as a cynical farmer, I'm sitting here thinking, well, there's not much money in it for me. So where is the extra value coming from? You know, obviously, a lot of these things have to be tested on farms. So following on from that, as a farmer who's actually invested in a research facility, how would you look on me? Am I a research institution or am I a farmer? I suppose is the moot point, but I'm registered as a farmer who happens to want to do research. I don't quite know how I should um, identify myself on the form. OK, um, to go to the first point, how many farmers actually apply? Um, there haven't been that many, to be honest. Um, the uh, farmers have engaged, particularly larger farmers. Um, big uh, agribusinesses have, have, have engaged. Um, but there are a number of things that I'm, I'll not get bogged down in, in the whole issue of state aid and, and what have you, but farm businesses sometimes think that they can uh, apply for grant and uh, apply for grant for innovations that relate to their farm and their farm alone and not for onward sale. Um, and under state aid, that starts to get a little bit awkward, particularly during the period when we were receiving um, you know, the basic payment scheme or single farm payment or CAP payments, whatever you want to them. So that all got pretty complicated. Um, but farm businesses can indeed apply, and a number do as kind of uh, groups, you know, production groups working together as a, a kind of cohort that, that engage. From your own perspective, uh, it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to en engage as a, a commercial business that a farming business would be, in which case, if it was in the micro or SME bracket, you'd be receiving 60 or 70 percent grant. If you had constituted your business as a, as a um, research training organization, and the articles, articles of association showed that you were such, then you could engage at that level and receive 100 percent of the grant, 100 percent of the costs as grant. But in that environment, you would have to disseminate all of the IP, and you would not be able to exploit it for your own use. Correct? Whoops, Hi. that's triggered a whole lot of other questions. <laughs> Question over there, yeah. Uh, John Malloy from the National Physical Lab. The total uh, stream is worth 20 million, and you have 5 million for the supply chain and 2 million for the productivity. Have you a guideline on how many projects you would actually like to fund? OK. Um, we've obviously got to work on, on kind of the averages in the past. Um, we emphasize that it's maximum of 2 million total project costs, just to reiterate, and 5 million total project costs. If you were to take um, the kind of applications on average in the past, 
We've said up to two million in the past for other uh, funding streams, and we generally see the average request for grant floating around the five hundred thousand pound mark. You know, not everybody goes for full two million pounds worth of costs because obviously they've got to fund the difference between the grant and what's available. Um, we've never gone as high as five million before, um, so it remains to be seen what will happen. I'm sure. Um, uh, the academic community would like to receive a large proportion of that, but they're limited to 30%. So uh, that constrains that particular element. Um, the businesses involved clearly need to fund the rest that they don't receive in grants. So we're expecting that um, uh, of the large multiple interventions, you may see an average project size of two to three million with grant of about one and a half or so. Um, we'd probably make about uh, 10 million available for those uh, large projects. So it's going to be half a dozen projects of that size that get funded. Um, those that are uh, looking at um, the, the single interventions, again, on average, we may see um, perhaps 20 projects getting funded at half a million each, consuming the other 10 million. But these are fingers in the air, you know, so we'd anticipate that out of this, we might see 20 to 30 projects funded in, in total. But the mix, who knows what will come forward. Okay, I think it's my turn. Rich Stanwyck from Multitech. So we are a telecoms provider doing industrial IT stuff. Just addressing the question, what's in it for me? Um, we, and I would assume a majority of the industrial actors here today, have um, more or less mature business cases, case studies of uh, existing products we've done. I mean, we have, we have a few of these where we have done work with telecoms equipment in agricultural scenarios, and we can, we can probably show where the money is for all the actors in the value chain, um, what either new money can be made using this technology or how efficiency can be improved and thus money be saved. So, I think that question goes back to us and all the other industrial actors here to prove that money can be saved or new money can be made. So I'm more than happy to talk about the business cases we have. Okay. So I'm Bill Park from the Agricultural and Horticulture Development Board. Uh, the thorny question as usual, Callum, what, where does levy money sit in this, if at all? Thank you. Okay, for those of you that uh, may or may not be aware, uh, the, the levy boards, AHDB, um, uh, receive uh, their revenue streams through a compulsory levy from producers on farm. Um, some research organizations uh, receive the levy as a voluntary levy. That's not the case with AHDB. It's a compulsory levy. As a consequence of that, government views that uh, revenue stream, the, the levy that's been secured as public money, despite the fact that it comes from, um, from industry. The reason they view it as, a, as public money is it effectively raised through a tax, a parafiscal tax. So given that AHDB money is public money, it means that the contribution that AHDB or the levy boards in, at an individual level make to any contribution has to be considered alongside the grant that we would provide. So if the consortium as a whole or an individual business was eligible for um, an average of, say, 60% grant, then our contribution as well as AHDB contribution would have to total no more than 60% of, of public investment. So that's the kind of state aid uh, situation. As far as um, AHDB engaging, and engaging in projects, of course, we're keen that the R&D committees within each of the individual sectors uh, look at the opportunities that exist here um, and um, make the case for investment in any given consortium. Now, what we need to do is perhaps move things forward quite quickly once grant, conditional grant letters are, are issued. We can't wait for R&D committees to convene to to make a decision as to what they will and will not invest in. So if an R&D committee was to, if you like, pre-approve, uh, give prior approval to the consortium to make the application, and if the application was successful, then we'd uh, welcome that. 
but the, the overall mix of AHDB levy and, and Innovate UK public funding need to meet the state aid criteria. It's complicated, but if it's a, a case by case point, we can talk about it individually. Once a grant's been awarded, can it be transferred to another party? And in particular, I've got two scenarios in mind. One, where the original collaborators want to, partway through the project, create a joint venture company, say, to progress the opportunity. And the second scenario, where you realize you just need a different type of partner in it. So you might want to swap one type of farmer out for a different one. Do you want to raise that? You, you can do a project change request, but what I would say, we're not really accepting those. So once you've been agreed for funding and um, you've been successful, uh, you should not be able to change anything, be it costs or partners, until you've got your grant offer letter. Only then may you go through the project change request process, but it is on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. So once you're successful, you, you need to really think about it and stick with that collaboration as, as much as possible and your costs. Sorry to ask another question, but in terms of innovation, you're talking about new technology. But what if you could utilize new technology to identify another way of doing it that obviates the need for that technology? I'm thinking about farmers, small farmers, where technology is beyond them in terms of their ability to pay for it, but they'd like to make steps forward in efficiency. What if I could use technology to identify a new way of analyzing what farmers are doing to remove the need for the technology altogether? Would that be allowable under a grant? Because I'm actually de-technologically the farm, in a sense, to help farmers you know, implement better knowledge to get to the same answer, but without actually needing it. Would that be an acceptable approach? You're getting into the realms of best practice and knowledge exchange and, and so on. Um, decisions. I'm saying that best practice is known to a point, but if the realms of best practice are limited and it takes technology to identify further best practice, then it may just need to be a way of analyzing, you know, using technology to identify it, and then after that the technology is no longer required. What, what you've just described is, is decision support and finding new ways of doing things, new systems, new production systems, so I would say that's in scope. We'll take questions from Callum at the back. Yeah, we've got a few questions here online, um, probably a mix between both Julia and Callum to answer. Um, Sanjeev Sharma would like to know, what does data-driven uh, based innovation exactly mean? Does this mean any technological innovations, say disruptive methods to produce propagation material for main crops are out of scope? Okay, I didn't quite hear the last bit, but data-driven, as I said uh, earlier on in my presentation, uh, data-driven thinking it pervades just about everything we do. What we're talking about here is technologies that will drive decision support and precision applications uh, and, and resource use efficiency uh, within the, um, the given environment that you're talking about. So uh, data-driven in itself is not particularly helpful, but think about it in terms of uh, decision support to drive precision and resource use efficiency. Okay. Uh, another one probably for you, Callum. Uh, Joanne Chamberlain would like to know, will bids be strengthened by having an impact partner to look at both the economic impacts, but also the environmental impacts of any new agricultural technology? Um, yes, you know, the, the whole concept of productivity and sustainability and waste reduction all come together and the impact that a given technology will drive will come into those, at least those three areas. So the more that you can show within your application that you're addressing productivity and sustainability and waste reduction, the, the challenge that was shown in my earlier slides, um, that would, of course, strengthen the bid. But um, I hasten to add, it's the, the point that uh, Julie was making earlier, you know, get excited about your application, articulate things in a way that this, the assessors can readily understand. And in so doing, it's likely that your score, score will be enhanced. But I wouldn't say that, um, uh, one aspect would be um, uh, given higher weighting than the other. Sustainability from the economic perspective, sustainability from the environmental perspective are equally as important. 
Okay. And a final question from Peter Beatty. Um, the overall support is for £90 million and the total grant fund is for £20 million. Can you explain how the other £70 million is being spent and how this spend complements what will be awarded through the grant? For example, what's the connection between the £20 million grant component and the innovation accelerators mentioned earlier in the year? Okay, uh, innovation accelerators is not something that we're talking about just now, but this is the first round of a number of CR&D calls. Um, there, it's likely that we will be allocating up to about 50 million from the 90 into CR&D. It's likely that the international component will, will um, uh, utilize uh, 10 million of that. It's likely that the community of practice will utilize 10 million. That leaves 20 million for the, the demonstrator program across the country. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll easily manage to spread the 90 million out around, uh, around all of our activities, I'm sure. Right, we're going to leave the questions there, but um, Callum and Julie, thank you very much again for all your help today, and they're going to be around the rest of the day, but please, you can join us in thanking them for the presentation today. Well, we've got four out of five, so that's a good start. Okay, my name's Chris Danks. I will speak to you again later, so I'll do a proper introduction then. But we'll just uh, run through the... We've got 15 pitch presentations. Uh, each presenter gets three minutes maximum. I'll be sitting at the front with a clock, which will click, count, count down three minutes. Uh, at, with one minute to go, I will stand up and look ominous. And at three minutes, you're off. So... <laughs> Um, so that's okay. There'll be no questions during this, so we're going to run through all 15 uh, uh, pitch presentations. We'll get five uh, speakers down at a time. So please save your questions for the networking, and it's a great way to introduce the companies uh, and get a chance to speak to them. Uh, also, could I just ask all the pitch presenters, all this has been broadcast on the web as well, so please uh, keep close to the microphone. Uh, your slides are in front of you, and there is a, a, a pointer with a clicker for you to move your slides through. All the slides are already... Uh, sequenced, so you've got to click it to move forward. There is also a pointer on there if you need to, but if you could stay behind the podium and close to the mic because it's been uh, recorded and broadcast on the WebEx as well. So we'll uh, kick off straight away with uh, Clive Blacker. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, so um, I was concerned it was all going to be Innovate branded, and fortunately it's not. Um, so a little bit about precision decisions. Um, we're a very much a farmer facing business. We, we deal more, more or less exclusively with farmers, working with them uh, with different hardwares and technologies, looking at automation uh, and agronomic. And, and we're in one of the rare positions where we, we aren't just engineers, but we, we're also half agronomists in a, in a sense as well, working with uh, the soil, working with plants, working, understanding the relationship and the equipment then that applies that. Um, and that's really important because we get a lot of data and one of our big challenges is, is collecting that data. So I'm very interested in telemetry systems. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, getting the data from the field in, in real time and helping farmers make really informed and targeted decisions. Mm -hmm. So anybody that can help in that area, I'm, I'm, very, uh, uh, I'm very interested in. We, do have, we have a huge amount of resources in terms of variable rate. Uh, we do a lot of variable rate applications looking at uh, taking uh, data from fields, from the soil, from uh, crops, uh, and from the canopy, and then vari variably targeting inputs. So if any people are looking for any help in that area, then that's something that we can offer, offer back. We do have a team of software engineers, and we develop our own, uh, some of our own tools. Uh, and our services are, are generally uh, very reliant on, on good quality data. Um, as a farmer as well, we have a, we have a trial site, so if anybody of you are looking to trial on or, or new technologies, then I'm, I'm very excited uh, about being able to put new technologies into place if I think it's going to add value to me commercially as a business, but also to the farm uh, to help us make better informed decisions. Um, for those of you that don't know some of the projects we've already been involved with, we've, we've done stuff in the past with robotics. I'm very interested uh, in, in anything to do with automation. Uh, and that's one area where I think telemetry can, can offer a, a huge amount. Uh, I'm quite interested in blockchain, although I'm not a fan of it, uh, in terms of understanding data and protecting data uh, and working, uh, working alongside then other data sources 
uh, as well. And, and that's something that we're really interested in this call in looking at is, is how we can use new data sources, uh, taking existing data sources and applying them in, in new ways, such as radar and, and LIDAR systems. That all leads, obviously, into a big data uh, uh, warehouse. Um, obviously, we can't do that without decent telemetry if we want to do it properly. Uh, so anybody that can help with modeling 3D, um, anyone that's got any virtual reality uh, experience, I'd be really interested in speaking to about how, how we can improve things. And my last slide's disappeared. That's got all my contact details on. That's <laughs> Thank me. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Clive. Uh, so do questions later. So next up is Henry. Uh, yes, I'm from the um, Centre for Applied Photonics in Glasgow. We're um, a part of the Fraunhofer organisation. Uh, we sit between university research and industry. We, we're all about developing uh, prototypes for industry. Um, the Fraunhofer is a huge organisation, uh, mainly in Germany. Um, we are, we've, we're the first one in the UK and we're specialising in photonics, so anything to do with light. Um, and we're really uh, wanting to help UK industry um, with some of the leading edge um, optics research coming out of UK universities um, and our own labs, of course. So we have a variety of um, expertise we can bring to bear in, in, in sensor systems, um, but in the um, agricultural sector, um, there are many opportunities where we can contribute. Um, this is, uh, ranges from uh, things like remote spectroscopy systems, hyperspectral imaging, um, things like localized sensors for particle measurement, soil, soil analysis, that sort of thing. Um, but also um, implantable sensors. We do work on microchips and, and microfluidic sensing. Um, and we're really um, looking to, to partner with, with end users in this sector who um, can, can give us the challenges that we can solve with our, with our system. So we, we really take um, lab table advance um, sensors and, and miniaturize them, ruggedize them, make them um, appropriate for, for use in the field, literally in this case. We've worked in many other sectors, um, and this is our first foray into agriculture, but we uh, want to bring the benefits we've brought to, to renewable energy, to oil and gas, to manufacturing and, and um, uh, medicine um, to, to this sector as well. So, so again, so end users, system integrators, um, partners on, on, um, on, on production and field trials um, would be interested to talk to. Uh, we're very experienced in uh, Innovate UK. We, we, uh, bids, we've had um, quite a few over the years, um, and we've got about an 80% success rate in applying for these grants. Um, so we're good at going through that, that, that process with, with the consortia. Um, and um, yeah, so if, if you're interested in, in getting the sensor technology that can enable um, some of this precision um, agriculture, um, then, then talk to me um, and we can um, certainly uh, build a good application together. Thanks, I've Henry. got some minutes to spare. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Perfect timing so far. And next up is Simon. Oops, got my timer. Right. Um, grand data. We do pretty much what it says on the tin. We measure the environment above and below ground, so solar radiation, air temperature, air humidity, soil temperature, soil humidity, all the stuff you get in a conventional weather station. Um, ah, there we are. Right. This is how we do it, how we approach it. This is potatoes, bottom left, if you don't spot them. First thing we do is we look at how the crop develops, because that's the core of it. So what does it need as it goes through its growth cycle? At some points, those who are deep into potatoes will know it needs to be damper, then it needs to be drier, then you need to know what temperature it is before you ship it, all those things. So there's the start of it. The next thing, though, is the supply chain. I've borrowed two slides from AHDB. Thank you very much. On the right, their analysis of the supply chain. It's quite complicated. All sorts of people want all sorts of different, different things. What our aim is is to collect all that data from the field so that if you're the grower, you know whether to water this week. If you're the packer, you know how the crops are coming along. If you're the retailer, you know 
where what the provenance has been of that batch of potatoes, or it could be parsley, or it could be olives, or it could be apple orchards. And um, finally, of course, the people I love are the agronomists because they're data-centric, and especially with them in mind, we have a camera on each crop, and they can look at what the crop looked like yesterday. So if the grower says it's emerged, the agronomist can see just how emerged it is and save a wasted journey. A bit more than that, though. Oh, you cut my slides. There's a slide missing. I was going to show you how we did it and laid things out in the field. Some of the data is very local. Some of it is farm-based. Some of it is um, field-based. And there is an art in that. I could rabbit on about rabbits, but I think my time's just about ending, by the way, of it. Oh, so what am I interested in? Uh, anybody who wants to get, take part in field trials, we have engaged with packers in the past. Uh, there are a few farmers in the room, that would be excellent, so we get the real environment rather than protected and carefully nurtured trials fields. And um, I'm open to anybody who has a gap in their consortium for just that basic data acquisition in the field and 13.12 to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Simon. So next up is Blair. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I, I'm Blair Edwards. I lead the data technologies team um, for IBM Research UK. So we were set up uh, actually by some government funding to come in and collaborate with researchers from SDFC at the Hartree Centre, which is up near Manchester. Um, and our remit was to basically come in and demonstrate the benefit of kind of big data, AI, um, simulation, high performance computing to a range of UK industries. Uh, and for my group, agriculture has been kind of one of our key places that we found a lot of potential. Um, so we've, we've done some projects uh, already uh, working with SDFC and collaborating with Roth Hampstead Research to look at how you might be able to uh, deploy a geospatial data platform, um, which would allow researchers and innovators to uh, get hold of their data, integrate multiple data sets, work with their data much faster, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and kind of do, and do, do what they do better and faster. Um, these are just some examples of, of sorts of data we work with. Uh, and then how do we all fit in kind of in the big picture? Um, so the idea here is that there are lots of people generating data. Lots of you, you here are running trials, doing remote sensing, building sensors, collecting farm management data, all this sort of thing. Uh, we don't profess to be able to generate agricultural data. Uh, at the same time, there are lots of researchers in academia, also within companies, who are generating lots of brilliant decision support models, uh, lots of disease uh, spread models, uh, crop yield production models. Uh, and then at the same time, there are lots of people who are actually interested in providing services to end users, providing services to farmers, to suppliers, to retail, uh, to logistics, whoever it might be within the supply chain. Um, and where we, where we see ourselves sitting is kind of in this piece between the data and the people who want to work with the data. So we've, been, we've done a proof of concept with Roth Hampstead looking at how you can deploy a geospatial platform um, and bring in lots of different data sets from different sources make it easy for people to work with the data, um, and then share the data and the insights that they generate from that data with end users. Uh, and we've talked to lots of people uh, and had lots of interest. Uh, and if you're interested in talking to us, if you have a challenge with data, um, either integrating different types of data, uh, handling the scale of data you have, uh, or just how you can share your data and your insights with people, um, we'd, be, we'd be interested to, to, speak to, to speak to you. Um, as said, uh, we're working with SDFC, so uh, one of our collaborators is Gemma Curtis is over there. She's her hands up in the air. Uh, so yeah, come and talk to one of us, um, and we can always have follow-up discussions either today or, or in the future. Brilliant. Thanks. Perfect timing. Thanks, Blair. Uh, next up, Charlie. Hi there. So I'm Charlie from Let's Grow. So we've been developing systems for indoor agriculture. So we've talked about controlled environment agriculture here, um, protected growing, 
that's where, that's where we fit in, and this is where we see the future of certain crops production going to maximise efficiency, um, not just in the UK, but, but all around the world. Um, so it's very important to say that we're very much a mission-driven company. We're doing this for the, both the environmental um, sustainability and the economic side of it, um, and that's sort of where the technology come from. So aeroponics, for those that don't know, is growing with roots suspended in a dense mist. Um, this provides the nutrients, the water, and the all-important gaseous exchanges that our plants need to grow efficiently. Um, we use closed-loop systems, so we recirculate the water. Uh, that's seen to get an up to 95% water reduction compared to field-based agriculture in, for, for things like lettuce and leafy greens. Um, we've shown in trials an 80% average across the board increase in growth rate compared to hydroponics. And that's really a fundamental sort of biological difference um, where our plants have extreme, um, extremely good access to gas in the root column, which means they can grow as efficiently as possible. Um, the growth rate is quite important there. The, our, our plants actually just grow faster in terms of the edible biomass. Uh, we've got some nutrient trials going on at the moment to ensure that that crop comes out the same quality. Um, and consistency-wise, we've shown a massively increase of consistency of crops, so reduced wastage um, compared to certain hydroponic techniques. The other side of what we do is software. Uh, so we're building a farm management system for indoor growing, which automates all of your data collection, um, your, um, all of your actuation in the farm, your lighting, your irrigation, your nutrient dosing, and that all feeds into one platform. And that's sort of why we're here today. Um, I have been pulling together a consortium for improving automation in indoor agriculture. Um, so that's both robotics and the data side of things. So anyone here that is involved in uh, automation, robotics, from whatever industry it may be that could be applied in, in these indoor facilities, I'd like to talk to you. Um, any innovative growers that want to diversify their revenue streams, we're interested in talking to you. Um, as well as the machine learning data side. So we work with University of Bristol, University of Sussex, STFC, recently joined uh, the Oracle Global Cloud Accelerator Program. So we've got quite a lot of research collaborations going on and we're very much about partnering to further this industry. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, so if these uh, speakers would like to go back to their places, could we get the next five uh, to come to the front, please? So Alam Jir Hussain, Gareth Jones, Colin McEwen, John Malloy, and John Newbold. If you could come on down. I've always wanted to say that, sorry. I'll just give them a chance. Alam Jir, it's the York first. One, two, three, four, five. Perfect, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, three minutes for project partner. I spent 30 years for life partner. So it's challenging. All right, I'm from Anglia Raskin University, one of the IT research institute I'm leading over there. Uh, so what is my core area? AI data, IoTs, microscopic lens, and mobile phones. So we develop mobile enable expert system for diagnosis. Uh, so that uh, is related to colorimetric change, feature analysis, uh, parasitic attack, soil and weather conditions, and uh, core target is to develop decision support system in real time, particularly for remote area, so that uh, we don't need cloud facilities. Many countries and many remote areas, they don't have that facility. Currently working for a GCRF uh, global partnership project so I'm looking for a partner to submit a bid uh, end of September. We already submitted another one with uh, five Asian and one South American countries. We have good partnership globally, so if you are interested to develop global partnership, that, that's an opportunity. Particularly focusing towards condition monitoring, so like skin, smell, uh, temperature, parasitic attack. So smell is, we did quite a lot of work on uh, electronic nose, and particularly for analysis, diagnosis, prediction, and monitoring, core target is to develop decision support system for treatment. Like if you think about chicken in the poultry industry remote area, very little facility for diagnosis, so can we develop mobile and our expert system uh, to monitor the condition, parasitic attack, 
temperature changes, their motion, movement, noise, all can be analyzed by mobile phone. That gives an opportunity. Uh, my name in the delegate list at the top, so easy to find me. If you feel like we have opportunity to develop partnership, that's a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay, next up, Gareth. Thank you very much. Um, I love light, and what uh, digital farming is all about is turning photons into food. Um, what we're aiming to do is uh, take uh, state-of-the-art technology in both uh, the lighting, hydroponics, uh, renewable energy, sensors, IoT, and integrate those at scale into a solution that, develop, that develops both the commercial reality of indoor farming and the sustainability aspects. We focus that on um, uh, a particular output from the farm as part of the learning of this, um, which would be nutritious foods in order to uh, encourage um, healthy eating. Um, so nutritious foods and beverages as output from the crops uh, that are grown in this system. The aim is to take, um, be able to grow um, indoors in locations that are normal buildings um, but to be able to do that in the commercial reality of making money. Uh, so we're focused on high value crops that have high nutrition content and want to control the growth environment such that we can be certain of what's coming out the other end, both in terms of the morphology of the, of, of the plants, the how, how large they are and how big they are, but also the chemical content of, the, uh, of them in terms of their nutrition. And then be able to, as an output from that, be able to provide a balanced selection of different foods that have different guaranteed uh, nutrition content. What we really need um, is, so first of all, from the point of view of the location, we, we understand that in order to do this properly, we need to work at scale. So we, we're working from a 150,000 square foot facility um, that has pretty unique characteristics. It's completely enclosed and secure. So the, the climatic control within there is very uh, well regulated. And what we want to do is be able to prove that we can take our systems and be able to put them into normal buildings to augment local delivery of nutritious foods. Uh, as, as, as we heard earlier, new, uh, vertical farming systems allow us to um, uh, reduce uh, the use of water, but also we're looking to bring in renewable energy as well in order to reduce the use of, um, uh, of energy consumption, which is the, probably the largest part of a vertical farm is turning the, uh, the, the photons, uh, is generating the photons um, with the electricity. Um, so. What we need are people skilled in data analytics because what we're doing with the systems is putting sensors everywhere, testing both the inputs, the growth processes and the outputs. So we're interested in analysis of that and also then uh, moving towards automation and looking for robotics uh, experts to come and help us move from manual processes to automatic processes. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs> Perfect timing. Next one up is Colin. Okay, Doug, so uh, thank you very much. We've just got uh, a couple of slides. Basically, SRUC is a well-established research, uh, education, and advisory organization. It's going through quite a period of transformation right now. But what I wanted to highlight here, um, and it's great to see so many startup young companies here, is what we can offer you and others in terms of partnerships to meet the needs of this call. So there's a number of aspects to what we do uh, that are quite unique uh, and not just cover Scotland. That's the point I wanted to make. So we've got a number of aspects. I won't read all this out, but in terms of our pillars of activity within our research team, we have the, these sections we work in, a couple to bring, really to bring to life to you. One which I think is, 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 is quite interesting right now is our genomics package and our, our genomics package that we have working with our scientists in terms of some of the new streams of activity and new disruptive technologies we're developing with our scientists linked to our livestock capability within the organization. We have a unique dairy and livestock capability. 
part funded now through CL, uh, and we are an active member of all three of the sorry three of the Agitech centres. Uh, so we have an asset base there to use. My role in terms of being Director of Commercialisation and Innovation is very much to bring these to life. So we've got great opportunities to use some scale now. We have got poultry units, which are a uh, £6 million investment, be the biggest in the UK. We've got a green cow facility on one of our farms, which is analysing CO2 emissions, which is really credible now in some of the stuff that Callum was talking about. Also, to point out our opportunity within our uh, veterinary and advisory service, we have uh, uh, active involvement well, across the whole of the UK with the health surveillance scheme, which is a real form of collaboration that Callum was talking about also. So these are two or three aspects of what we do. We also have um, an interesting piece of work round about the crop and soils aspect of what we do and looking at healthy soils and clean water. Finally, we have an interesting group of people through our Rural Policy Centre, which also advise not just on policy in Scotland, but are very active in the UK, working with the UK government. That gives us a great loop into identifying areas of research that are required or the government is interested in, and we're quite proactive in that. And the final point is we have over 300 consultants, vets and on-farm consultants delivering that across the UK, mainly in Scotland, but as I said, our veterinary offer covers uh, surveillance tactics right across the UK. So basically, we're open for business, and that's what's here to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Okay, next up is John. And could you just uh, remind the speakers to stay close to the microphone, please, so that we can pick you up on the WebEx. Uh, Thank you. Hi, I'm John Malloy from the National Physical Lab. Um, we're a government-owned physical research laboratory. We cover all areas of physical measurement. Um, from biology, chemistry, uh, the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we're specialists in accurate measurement, the traceability of that measurement and understanding how the measurement propagates, uh, both in the production uh, and the delivery of products. Uh, we have capability in uh, visible imaging and the near, far, infrared, microwave, radio areas. We also work on satellite, earth observation, airborne platforms. Um, we have a, a considerable in-house agri-tech team of about 25 scientists, but we can reach further into our staff of 600 scientists. Um, we have quite a bit of experience on uh, phenotyping of crops, uh, in-field monitoring, uh, in particular on arable cereals, but we've also worked on automated harvesting of um, brassicas, potatoes, various soft fruit, and in uh, production line management, sorting, identifying of damaged or sub substandard product. Uh, we've also been looking at animal rearing, pre-slaughter, grading of meat, meat fat uh, bone, uh, and then post-slaughter verification of that. Uh, ideally, we're looking for partners within the, the production sectors that need innovative measurements or are looking for confidence in that measurement. Um, this is where our speciality lies. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, John Newbold. Thank you. Yes, uh, from uh, Volac. Volac is a UK company that uh, is active in uh, dairy nutrition, both manufacturing human nutrition products. We process a lot of uh, whey from cheese manufacturing uh, and also uh, in supplying inputs into dairy farming. Uh, those inputs tend to be in uh, three categories. Uh, if you look at the top uh, right of the slide there, uh, milk replaces for young animals, principally calves and lambs. Um, we also produce uh, silage additives for assisting in the conservation of forage uh, and supply a range of fats to dairy cows for uh, higher productivity and, uh, and uh, health and well-being. Three uh, example ideas on here uh, that might or might not be relevant to this particular call. Number one, grow better cows. Uh, there's a lot of research institutions in the United Kingdom that have their own dairy replacement calves as, as, as heifers and they rear them and those calves in due course become cows. Uh, we are missing an opportunity to really document, sense, apply, measure the experience of that young animal uh, and then uh, its experience and its performance and its health and its well-being when it becomes a cow. And why not put all of those data together 
using existing uh, measurement technologies, potentially novel measurement technologies, build the database, mine the database, learn how to grow better cows. The second uh, area, uh, dairy cows to produce uh, high, high levels of milk, it's all about rate, rate of nutrient acquisition. Uh, so if we're beginning with grass uh, on a forage-based uh, system here in the, in the UK, a uh, whole range of technologies that could be applied, ranging from grass genetics and working all the way through to and including animal genetics at the other end, uh, these are often not very well aligned. Why don't we coordinate and align those uh, technologies, understand their interactions, increase the productivity of milk from grass? And thirdly and finally, I'm okay for time I think here, uh, a little bit more related to our own uh, product area in relation to supplemental fats. If you're buying a fat product to feed to a dairy cow, it's quite expensive. You better make best use of it. There are good reasons to believe that different cows, either genetically different or phenotypically different, will respond to different fats in different ways. We need to learn what those relationships are and get a better handle on predicting those responses. Uh, so anybody who's interested either by, with technologies that are relevant for the execution of such projects, technologies which are relevant for the implementation of the results of such projects uh, in practice, uh, research organisations with capabilities uh, who are interested in these areas, uh, be delighted to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Brilliant. If we can swap over the speakers again. So for the, for the final five, it's uh, David Korn, Catherine Pratt, Julian Gardner, Sasha Redman, and Ian Wheel. So if they could come to the front, that'd be great. One, two, three, four, five. Phew. Okay, and it's David up first. No pressure, everyone's kept to time exactly so far. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm David, I'm a professor in AI. I would like to stress, I mean artificial intelligence, not artificial insemination. <laughs> that mistake has been made before in similar contexts. Uh, for the first hour of my talk today, I'd like to talk about a company called Farmhand, which I'm representing today. Um, oh, I do the slides, right, okay. So I'm, I'm here mainly representing Farmhand, that's what the pitch is about. So Farmhand uh, is a company that was uh, formed to exploit and commercialize the technology uh, from a very, very successful 2017 Innovate UK project. Uh, please go and have a look at the website. Uh, you'll notice it's a .in domain. We are uh, a UK company, but most of our business at the moment is exporting data-driven solutions uh, to India. We're ex expanding to China, and we, we don't mind working in the UK as well. So the project that we are a spin-out from was an energy catalyst project, and what we were trying to do was save energy in some subsistence farms in southern India. And it quickly became apparent that that saving energy means saving water, because most of the energy was used in, in, in irrigation pumping groundwater. Uh, so our context is, is trying to save water and increase yield uh, for subsistence farmers. What we did is we put together some uh, really sharp, if I say so myself, AI technology um, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with not very much data, but, but so that we could put systems in Indian farms at, which were affordable and which would quickly lead to increased yield, uh, savings in water, and increased profits for Indian farmers. And we had dramatic successes. We've had multiple awards so far. The value proposition um, is a kind of modest restatement of the results that we've had, and the technology is basically AI uh, wrapped around good uncertainty management. And uh, so what, what you see on the left on that slide is, is just a roundup of the results we've had in India. We're currently rolling it out to further Indian farms, and 
Uh, we also have several contacts in China who are, who are currently seeking to fund us to expand this in China. So what we're really concerned with is increasing yield by 30 to 50 percent while at the same time reducing water use outside. Um, and we can reduce water by up to 80 percent. And we, the, the one particular idea we have for, for making this work even better is if you have multiple farms at the same time. That will make the AI system work better. That's, I think, all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next up is Catherine. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catherine Pratt from the Small Robot Company. Um, we're all here today, really, to try and see if we can improve farming. Um, at Small Robot Company, we think at the moment that farming is a bit broken, um, specifically around the arable side of things. We think one of the main causes of this is the use of big, clunky, heavy machinery, specifically tractors. Um, they're inefficient, inaccurate. Farmers are having to apply fertilizers to an entire field rather than using precision. And at Small Robots, we like small. There we go. So we're building a fleet or a team of small robots. Um, in our team, we've got Tom, Dick, and Harry. And then we've got the brainy back end, which is Wilma. Tom's our analysis robot who can go out into the field, collect imagery, collect soil samples, collect lots and lots of data, feeds that data back into Wilma. Wilma does all the AI analysis. Um, she can then interpret the data that Tom has provided in order to produce roots for uh, Dick to go out and to apply pesticides, fertilizers, and potentially laser weeding. The ambition is that we do this um, within a two centimeter accuracy, so we're taking GPS positions throughout. Harry is a punch planting robot, so we'll go out and plant a seed directly into a specific location. Then when we send the Tom robot out, Tom can do that analysis, know exactly which plant we're talking about, can feed the information back into Wilma, which then enables us to keep the whole cycle on a precision basis. Excuse me, just lost my notes. So the idea of using precision is that we cut down on the energy wastage and we also cut down on the chemical wastage, hence saving overheads for the farmer and saving the environment at the same time. We don't actually want to sell these bots, though, to the farmers. If you go into a farm today, you open up the barn, there's a whole load of machinery in there, costs a fortune, used very little throughout the period of the year. So why are we going to sell these to the farmer and just give them one overhead for another overhead? So we want to sell farming as a service. The objective here is that we sell our robots as a service on a per hectare basis. A farmer can sign up, can have as much or as little of the service as they want, um, and they don't then have the overheads of looking after the robots, maintaining and replacing if the robots go wrong. The idea being our Tom robot is a small robot, hopefully 10 centimeters, our prototype at the moment, slightly larger, but she's out in the fields taking pictures of the, the plants. We'll put one, farm, one Tom robot on a farm, and then we can turn up with the other robots as and when they're needed, based on the data that's fed back from Tom. So that's us as a company. That's us with our ambition to save farming and feed the world. Um, what are we here for today? We're looking for anyone who can help us with this vision in any way, shape, or form um, in any part of the solution. We've got a number of collaborations already, but we're still eager to talk to anybody. And we're also interested in anybody who might potentially want to be using the robots and the service at the end of the day once it's here. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> and next up, Julian. Thank you. Um, so we're um, a New Zealand-based uh, company um, of about 30 people in Hamilton, a bespoke uh, agri-software developers and uh, consultants. Um, we work across a number of areas, quite a lot of it in the livestock sector and dairy, in product development, supply chains, um, data standards, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and also smart biological models. So that's taking the sort of science of farming and turning it into data-driven and in, in some cases predictive solutions. I just wanted to mention a little bit about um, some work we're doing in, in data, particularly around sort of customer expectations around data in agriculture and food, um, and also what that data uh, means um, for uh, producers around um, bespoke products and tools, analysis and forecasting, 
um, pharma supply chain productivity and effective use of, of interconnected data. And we're involved in, in, in various parts of, of, of that sort of area. We're working on a project at the moment commissioned by the HDB to develop a code of practice for the sharing of farm data. Um, it's something that we have done already uh, in New Zealand in the last few years. Um, and at the moment, uh, we're part way through that sort of industry consultation, which we're hoping to conclude in October with a, um, a draft code of practice um, and some recommendations around adoption. Um, what that's really sort of saying is that we work very much in this agri-data space. We build solutions that are um, for customers, so we develop IP for them and hand over that IP, so we're quite happy to work in partnerships and projects where we develop things that you may want to retain the IP for. Um, and beyond the code of practice that we developed in New Zealand, we've also developed a uh, thing called Farm Data Standards, which is really a set of um, uh, vocabularies for data, uh, and off the back of that also a thing called Data Linker, which is a a set of technologies and standardized data transfer system. So really, I guess the message is we're, we're, we're all things agri-data, um, and we're very keen to work and partner or contract into um, uh, projects that are going on and that may be relevant to this call that needs expertise in, in particularly livestock, genetics, and, and dairy data, but also increasingly we're getting into uh, cropping and, and horticulture as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> Okay, every site next. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sasha Redman from Every Site. We're a software solutions provider based in Edinburgh. We've been involved in food and farming for 20 years now, and our CASI platform runs Red Tractor, Leafmark, and Environment Agency permitting schemes. Uh, we also developed and operate the EAML2 pig movement licensing system for AHDB and DEFRA. So, we've worked for years with Red Tractor helping integrate farm assurance data into the food industry and saw the need for getting better data deeper into the supply chain. Our Shore platform has been developed in response to that need, enabling consent-based sharing of data whilst minimizing the burden on participants. Businesses need only document their direct relationships and activities, and the system uses this information to map the entire supply chain. Our claims engine transforms complex data into simple statements that aid purchasing decisions around suppliers, their products, and even specific batches of product. So let's look at a specific implementation. For years, Tesco had operated their own assurance scheme called Nurture. From April, they now accept Red Tractor or Global Gap certification instead, but Tesco still wanted oversight of their entire supply chain through their suppliers. We work with Red Tractor to invite all the participants onto the Shore platform Growers are asked to confirm their relationships with Tesco's primary suppliers to enable the sharing of inspection and performance data based on automated scoring of their audit report. Suppliers now have access to live assurance data and receive alerts of critical changes. Farmers, now needing only a single annual inspection, save time and money. With just four months between final agreement and launch, we completed rollout on time and the service has been extended ahead of schedule to allow farmers to switch to alternate certification bodies introducing competition and choice. So what we want to do, we've already built a platform that's out there, being used successfully in the industry every day to make purchasing decisions, but we now want to understand the complexities involved in mapping individual batches, as sharing data at this level can give so much more insight into a supply chain. Firstly, we need to find supply chains with problems. This may be a lack of information at the end of the chain, or a desire to demonstrate product attributes that add price premiums. This to be, needs to be mapped through complex production steps and work with existing data sources and systems to avoid adding burden that restricts uptake. We want to find sector experts that can help us design metrics to transform farm data into simple actual output that informs purchasing decisions and ultimately develops into commercial services funded through subscription revenue. I've listed some potential applications here, but we want to be guided by the industry. Our experience shows a large carrot or stick is needed to get a supply chain to properly engage and also, we must integrate wherever possible through data exchange and APIs to eliminate data entry. Such a system then just becomes the natural order. If this has got you thinking, or you're confused and want to ask me more questions, then please do come and find me and we'll chat further. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, here. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ian Wheel from Breeder. Uh, Breeder is a platform that's basically been built to 
drive a facilitated marketplace of, for livestock professionals and livestock farmers around uh, the UK and hopefully the world. Our belief is that there's a huge amount of data and productivity that can be used by very closely integrating the supply chain and actually improving the sharing of data between the farmer and the process. And we do that by facilitating the transaction and the supply chain management. That's at the core of it. But underlying it really is providing data, and not just data to farmers, but a productivity tool to farmers that enables them to better meet specification, better meet the needs of the processors and the retailers. And with that, being able to drive, provide traceability right down, whether it's of accreditations or performance, right down into the retailer and consumer. So from that, hopefully we can get enough data, we can share that data between all the different farmers and build a best practice about how we actually do better livestock productivity around the UK. That's it. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I suppose if you want to get in touch with me, it's to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you to all the speakers for keeping to time. We are dead on time for dinner, so lunch will be served. The lunch is served to those doors on your, your left, uh, go through there for the networking lunch. You've just heard 15 speakers, so there's at least 15 people that you might want to go and see. And just to remind you that the full delegate list is on the back of your program, so if you want to then find people during the, the, the next hour, then please do. And we start again in this room at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>